I had quite an experience on Friday. I had taken a dear friend to an appointment in White Rock, and while she was in it, I had a snack at the White Spot and was spending some time looking at the service for today. So all of my sermon preparation notes were all over the table, my book, my books, my Bible, everything. Great big table, awesome way to do it. When a woman, a stranger, who had got up to leave from her table, came over to my table and slammed her hand down on one of the books that I had just been looking at and said to me, what is this book? And I sputtered that it was John Donahue's uh, book of blessings, to which she replied, why are you reading it? Well, I said, honestly, I'm looking for some divine intervention or energy to come into a sermon that I'm writing. The next few minutes was a whirlwind of conversation. We touched on my marital status, how old I was. When I told her I was 46, she said, wow, you look way younger than that. And I thought, best comment in this conversation so far. (laughs) She wanted to know how many children I had. We talked about the situation in Israel. It was a cheerful conversation. She and her husband were lively and enthusiastic. She'd been part of the United Church in Langley and the Marriage Encounter Program. Does anybody remember that from the 70s? She and her husband now attended another church in White Rock. I told her about you, the church I served, why I loved the United Church of Canada. And then we moved into what my sermon was about. She asked me, did I know that Joel was a minor prophet and wrote apocalyptic prophecy? To which I replied, yes, I got that far. (laughs) Her husband chimed in that he was pretty sure we were in apocalyptic times, and I wasn't sure what to do with that comment. As she was leaving, she turned to me and said, It doesn't seem like the Holy Spirit is working through you today. (laughs) I think she meant it with all the love, right? She could see that I was feeling quite anxious about this sermon. And then she said, I will pray for you. And then she left. And I was left with this stubborn inkling that she might be right. And this comfort that surprised me since I typically bristle at the thought of strangers praying for me. I was also left knowing with certainty that when my son, Matthew, heard the story of this encounter, he would add it to his list of mom's unusual conversations with strangers. It's only three chapters, the book of Joel. And the prophet warns of the catastrophe for the people of Israel and the plan for God's deliverance from that crisis. The prophet depicts of the advent of the day of the Lord and its final judgment and blessings. Poetic in his speech, Joel is speaking to the temple, the congregation, and priestly circles. You only heard two sets of two verses from the book of Joel, which Marg read. But I think it's fitting that you hear some of the rest of it. Impending wrath, locust invasion, cosmic battle. These are some of the verses from the book of Joel. And I'd like you to listen for how this word may speak to you. Hear this, O elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. With the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust has left, the destroying locust has eaten. 
for a nation has invaded my land, powerful and innumerable. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste to my vines and splintered my fig trees. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Is it not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are ruined because the grain has failed. How the animals groan. The herds of cattle wander about because there's no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep are dazed. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It's near. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened. And the stars withdraw their shining. I wonder if you know these references. The Walking Dead, the 100, Battlestar Galactica, Fahrenheit 451, the Fifth Horseman, the Hunger Games, City of Embers, the Terminator series, Planet of the Apes. It's a small sample of the apocalyptic literature that's in our culture which doesn't even mention the numerous visual artists and musicians that weave these themes into their art. I live with people who have a calendar alert set up so they don't miss the newest Walking Dead episode. They have listened to the War of the Worlds in its entirety. They've read many books, apocalyptic in nature, and they're dismayed that Fallout 4 is only available on newer gaming consoles. I don't get the lure and fascination, even though I can be convinced that the storylines are intensely compelling. I move into the role of comforter when a major character, a good guy, dies in the latest Walking Dead episode even though I typically have no idea what or who they are talking about. Reality, for me, has enough threads of despair, fear, and hopelessness that I can ever deal with. I manage with social media fatigue on a regular basis, entertaining clips from Jimmy Fallon and the laughing baby videos fail to fully release the overwhelm I feel with the coverage of that which troubles us, the things, the places, the leadership decisions that make us angry or sad or depressed beyond coping. It leads me to be extremely cynical and anxious about our world. When I was reading Joel, I found myself comparing our realities to those of this ancient prophet. A nation has invaded my land. The ground mourns. Joy withers away among the people. And Joel's solution is interesting. With fasting, with weeping, with mourning, rend your hearts and not your clothing. Open your hearts. Rip them open to what's happening. Our hearts are ripped apart by images and stories. There's no doubt about that. And in amongst the crisis, Joel works to persuade the beloved people of God to return to God, to come back into the arms of the one who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. What might it mean to return to God? 
We often hear that the word sin means to turn away from God. So returning to God would be the opposite of sin. Returning to God is most definitely freedom, new life, the deepening of a relationship with the beloved who just wants to sit a while with you. How might our lives and outlook be changed if we choose to intentionally return to God? I was uplifted by the comments about people's experience with the lanterns this week. It's been on our Facebook page, and I will find a way to post it to other places so more people can experience it. Spending moments with God, simply being in the presence of the presence, changes the way we see the world and our crucial part in it. Bishop Mano Ramalisha says our faith in the divine must mean that we compulsively love or we are abusing our relationship with God. Compulsively love. For me, that abuse looks like cynicism. And faith means that there is no choice but to love without limit, without judgment, without question. It is deepening the relationship with each other, showing up, listening, acting with integrity, respect, and care. It's being with the divine long enough to know how and what you are supposed to be doing. According to Joel, a new age is dawning. God will prevail and the day of judgment will bring blessing to the righteous, inclusive of all people. All creation is part of the recreation. This is the message of hope. God's spirit is poured out on everyone, male and female, slave and free. What might you imagine it to be like to live as God poured out the Holy Spirit on you. There seems to be no condition to this outpouring. Despite our insecurities and failings, our inability to speak or see clearly, the Spirit of God is poured out on everyone. Advent is a time of anticipation of the hope the restoration of creation in the coming of the Christ. We await Jesus. And as Steve Garness Holmes writes, Christ is coming into this world. God's dawn from on high breaks upon us, but it's not in disembodied light. The way the dawn comes is that God sends people into the darkness, people like Jesus, like us, who shine with God's life, God's light. It rises in us. We embody it. Our simple acts of love and courage, every act of kindness, every witness for justice, every prayer for another, no matter how feeble, no matter how doubtful or conflicted, every tear shed for the world, no matter how fragile, is light that transforms the darkness, that gives light to those who sit in the shadows of death and guides our feet on the path to peace. Christ stated on more than one occasion to look around. The kingdom of God is being revealed. The Spirit of God is poured out in the words and hope and restoration from Joel. And the compulsive and life-giving action of a stranger in the white spot. Amen.